So big thank you to Chris Hubbard and Mark Cohen and Chris McHugh actually for helping to, to put this together. Um, this will be very exciting and a, a timely meeting, I think, which I'm not sure, maybe seed saving is always a timely meeting, but it is the almost the first day of spring. So um, I will let you guys take it from here. Maybe Mark, you want to start us off and then maybe we talk for a little bit and then see you all shows up and maybe we can do some introductions. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, welcome everybody. And uh, just to remind everyone that this is uh, kind of a part three of a series that anybody who hasn't seen the earlier recordings, I believe uh, at least one of the links is on the email that went out. Um, then there was one before that. And the general theme <clears throat> has been resilience and basically looking at strategies for basically conserving biodiversity as a primary um, strategy for resilience. Uh, so I opened up with with a lot of big picture issues. And then last last month, we basically uh, navigated our way to seed, seed saving within that piece. So uh, I would reference those for people who might want to get a little bit more background, um, but not uh, not totally necessary. Um, yeah, it's it's my great pleasure to to introduce Chris Hubbard. We met about uh, four four to five years ago, I guess, and um, uh, at the at the BFA conference. And um, I immediately um, was impressed with the work that uh, Chris is doing with seeds. And um, there was a there was a seed swap and and gathering there and. Um, so I've been I've been working with seeds for a long time and thought that this would be a good thing share for the group and um, I think today we're gonna I'll let uh, Chris uh, open up with uh, a couple of his primary projects, but make sure that we have a lot of time left over to to do mostly Q and A today, um, and that can be people who watched the videos and have questions from the past or. Um, or for anything within a pretty wide range of subjects that that are uh, welcome questions. So um, I think everyone here got uh, got the material that that Chris uh, McHugh put together on on Chris Hubbard's work, and so um, I don't think we'll reiterate too much of that. Um, but I think what we'll do is um, is open up let uh, Chris describe a, a bit of the scope of his work, which is quite large, uh, get a picture of that, and then we'll uh, get into some questions uh, among ourselves and from, um, you know, folks from uh, wherever you're chiming in from. Uh, so, yeah, Chris, why don't you um, talk a little bit about the the uh, Feed Appalachia and, and um uh, the seed rematriation projects that you're working on, and maybe just a little bit of whatever you'd like to share on um, on the work uh, that you're doing. Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, everybody, glad to be here. Um, as as Mark was saying, I've I've got really wearing too many hats. I guess I've I'm um, trying to accomplish a lot of life works that I've been. Um, I've been trying to spread a lot of the knowledge around as best as I could. Um, so several years ago, um, I had started uh, a program and it was for families in need throughout Appalachia. And what it, it was uh, based on was people who were um, displaced by flooding, natural uh, disasters uh, in the Appalachian mountains. Uh, mainly central Appalachia. Um, that's that's what it had started at. But as I had saw, um, a lot of people, uh, you know, were talking about losing their homes, losing their material uh, things, heirlooms. And um, then I, I had heard a lot of people saying, you know, that one of the worst things that they had experienced uh, was actually losing their families um seed heirlooms because once they're gone uh you know they're outside of individual little, little isolated communities they don't exist 
which is another part of my work. Um, but so I had started this program, uh, started to give out um, seed to families in need. Uh, went everywhere from even um, children and things that were in apartment buildings and uh, urban locations that um, we tried to <clears throat> get like um, varieties that would be uh, good for bucket gardens or container gardens, uh, dwarf varieties of things. Um, so uh, last year I was, I was able to give out over 300,000 300, seed packets, um, which it was all, all done uh, on my own. I, I really don't have any help necessarily for this. So I, I do a lot of the traveling and, and everything on my own dime. Um, prior to that, I had uh, traveled throughout every holler, if you would, um, throughout Appalachia, collecting uh, families' varieties, uh, whether they be tomatoes or corn, or especially uh, greasy beans, which are a uh, uh, southern and Appalachian delicacy. It's a it's a bean that uh, a lot of people outside of Appalachia don't really understand what it is or never heard of it. So you've got um, this type of bean that can be either eaten dry or as a snap bean. It's called greasy bean because the actual hull of it has a, a greasy uh, look. <clears throat> they're um, really about worth their weight in gold in Appalachia. They're, you can go from regular um, a bushel of, of common beans. Uh, um, your regular snap beans may go for, in a hard year here, maybe $65 to $70 a bushel. Greasy beans, you're looking at, I've, I've seen them go for $200 a bushel. But we're talking about a bean also, uh, for the most part, that's that's two inches and that it is very difficult to pick a bushel of them. Um, but anyway, so those uh, a lot of uh, the tomato varieties, as I said before, they they're isolated uh, throughout these mountain communities. Um, so I would go from place to place, um, family to family and try to um, record their history of the actual variety and uh, save it, uh, document it. Um, I think one of my regrets in, in most of my work is, is I focused on the preservation aspect, um, the historical aspect, rather than the biological one. Um, I, I did not record as much of um, the taste of the tomato or, or necessarily um, how good it grew or the leaf structure, or et cetera. Now I'm going back and, and trying to uh, record that because um, that is a very important part of it uh, because that, that opens the door for a lot of uh, a lot of information later on for genetics, you know, and diversity, opening up the door to, you know, why is this particular variety good for uh, this climate, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm trying to backtrack and do that. But um, so the Feed Appalachia project, um, I have various farms here and there that will also help me grow. Um, doesn't have to be rare varieties but just heirloom good old-time varieties that your great-great-grandparents um would have grown you know no hybrids no gmos and um those that can be you know um, grown year after year and saved um and i tried to focus on two things that were acclimated to specific areas um which at times has been difficult to do because, um, you know, not, not having growers everywhere. So um, 
and that's I think a part of what uh, Mark and I probably will discuss throughout this is is um, not necessarily land races, but but growing heirlooms to benefit your family or or yourself uh, in your own climate, especially a climate that is changing daily. So that that's a difficult thing to to try and um, process. I. I I believe, but um, uh, especially for a beginner gardener. Um, a lot of people ask me, um, do you, I only save um, rare varieties or do I only save beautiful varieties? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> if, if, uh, if I can grow it, I'll save it. It's, uh, I think that everything deserves a, a place. There was a reason it was created uh, you know, and has evolved. So, um, for instance, eggplant. For for some reason, uh, eggplant is my nemesis. I don't know why. Um, I have grown everything, even coffee in our region. I've grown very, very difficult to grow, but eggplant seems to elude me. Um, it just doesn't do as well for me for some reason. So, even though that most gardeners would uh, shy away from that, I, I try to tackle it even further. Um, so after a lot of the traveling throughout Appalachia, uh, I'd been to a lot of different countries and uh, collected uh, seed and, and plant specimens. But uh, with Appalachia in particular, um, it's a very unique climate. Um, it's one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. And a lot of our biodiversity is just, it's nowhere else. Um, we've got a lot of untouched lands, you know, still here in Appalachia. And Appalachia. Pardon? Um, I think that was just an echo. If everybody who isn't speaking right now could mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I can't wait a second. So I can turn the video. Again, with um, with a lot of what what I've done throughout Appalachia, I've I've tried to okay. acquire um, well, not family. Saying family heirlooms and seeds, um, especially those with history um, throughout Appalachia and Kentucky. Um, I, I had um, started um, collecting seed as a, as a child. Um, my grandfathers were both seed keepers, uh, one indigenous, one not indigenous. And um, so I've, I've literally grown up um, with seeds, with gardening, with farming, um, tobacco farmers um, in my family. And um, there's always been that self of uh, that, that feeling or, or need for self-preservation, especially in, in here in Appalachia, we, things are different here. So we've tried, uh, you know, to, to keep ourselves uh, from drowning, if you would. Um, and saving seed, of course, is one of those things that throughout the world, it really saves us as much as it does save uh, species of plants. So um, through through that uh, collecting, I've, I've done a lot, a lot of traveling, and like I said, and we've um, got um, a preservation seed bank. And within that seed bank um, are, like I said, the Appalachian varieties, you know, like uh, the, the tomatoes. We've, we've probably got um, just an estimation, but we, I stopped cataloging at 5,000 varieties. Um, and we've we've got deep freezers that have, have not been cataloged yet. So there there is an unknown amount, um, possibly tens of thousands with tomatoes alone. Um, it's a lot to keep up with. 
and um, I've, I've tried to document as well as, as I can, but things are um, getting a bit too big for me. So I, I need some help with things and um, just trying to make sure that things are preserved for our future, you know, not, not just um, for growing, but for also historical um, reasons too. Um, so the indigenous seed rematriation project, um, we've, we've had probably over 6,000 varieties that I've, I've tried to, uh, save from extinction. Uh, these are varieties that, oh man, they've, some of them, there may be one to five seed left on the planet. That's it. And so we really have to try and decide whether, you know, we should, we should plant those five seed that, that are left or keep them as biological samples. It, it's uh, a lot of pressure, um, especially when you've got a plant species that's just down to that uh, small amount of survival. Um, but what I've tried to do with this project is I have collected and been given and been willed uh, thousands of varieties that were indigenous. Um, I'm a men's traditional dancer, so I would go on the powwow trail as a kid through teen, and then teenager and, and uh, adult, et cetera. <clears throat> and I would be given um, seed at powwows. Um, I've been called in the middle of the night. Um, you know, people tell me that they were going to send me seed and it's just, I've, I've collected in, in multiple, multiple ways. So through these, the lifetime really of collecting, um, it was a matter of trying to keep them from being extinct. So I've got students that grow and after we grow them, we, uh, if they're depending on the amount of seed, you know, we, we need a good enough quantity to keep it preserved and uh, keep it from extinction. So, um, sometimes that may only be, you know, a, a handful to a pound of seed. Um, once we get to that, um, a safe quantity, then I always try to rematriate, um, which let me explain that word a little bit. Um, a lot of people are confused by that. So in, in indigenous societies, um, most are matrilineal they are uh female or mother oriented whether the you know by the clans you are accepted through your mother's side not your father's unlike um other societies through the world that um would be colonizers etc you would you would hear or uh you know european uh they're patrilineal which are of course male. So you have repatriation, which is we've, we've all heard, I'm, I'm assuming before, but we, we prefer the word rematriation because it's, it's more of going back um, through our ancestors, um, you know, to our, our original mothers, our grandmothers. Um, seeds are an ancestral thing. They're our family. Um, there are mothers and sisters and, and um, like the word, you know, uh, in, in Jalagi, what Cherokee is silu. That's for corn. It's also mother. So, you know, in a lot of indigenous societies, it's like I had said, it's, it's um, mother related. So rematriation is where we try and take the seed that has been preserved and rematriate them back to their original peoples, whether it be the Ponca, uh, the, the, you know, the Lakota people, um, Wampanoag, et cetera. It just depends where, wherever. Um, 
also within our indigenous collection we're not we're not boxed into the lower 48 states uh our indigenous collection covers uh, world the whole world um it's Alaskan and Canadian First Nations people to Central and South America and Africa and Papua New Guinea, Melanesia, et cetera. It's uh, all over the world. And um, sometimes uh, we, we found that a lot of those seeds are, are lost. Um, <clears throat> and we all know why uh, various uh, problems throughout history um that that has taken a um a, a side road necessarily that that we're trying to get things back we're trying to um take our seeds back to their homeland back to their people and in self you know also return our food sovereignty uh it's it's a matter of also in appalachia i'm 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 trying to um help people be food secure and that's 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 a problem that um i think especially now with inflation and and everything that's going on is it's so important to, to feel and be food secure and in that um is possibly being able to, to uh, be uh have your own food sovereignty over over your life and over your family but so the indigenous rematriation project um we've got over six thousand varieties um most of those have not been grown out and rematriated that's the issue um we need responsible growers to grow them uh, I don't want to necessarily say organically, but I want to say naturally without pesticides, without herbicides, et cetera, or any uh, chemicals. Um, I want them grown as naturally as possible. Then they need to be sent back to us. Once they're sent back, like I said, after several different growers, um, then we can start the process of rematriation, uh, rematriating them back to their native people. Um, within that growing process, a lot of a lot of times I'm faced with um, a very very low amount of seed. Um, for instance, beans. Um, I have um, been given literally uh, aluminum packets um, that were dated in the '80s. And we're talking 25 plus years old that had been in freezers. Now, out of those 13 seeds, uh, or excuse me, out of 100, say 50 seeds that were uh, acquired, this is for a particular ponca bean, um, only 13 germinated. Uh, one actually produced. So out of, out of that entire packet there was one one plant and we had enough seed to be able to propagate it so um, you know it's uh sometimes it's it's very thin odds that we're able to uh keep them from extinction and one thing is when you get you know 10 20 seeds or whatever i have to make the choice of you know um uh, letting different people adopt them if I have 10 seed, for instance, I, I try to get uh, and keep two to three in our preservation bank. Uh, and then that seven, let's say, then I want to try and get seven other people to grow it. I figure the more um, experienced hands that are growing something, the more the more odds for better germination. Also, I mean, really, I don't, which I don't know. I mean, I... <laughs> The weather here this year is kind of scary, but um, what's the chances of seven different people all over the world having flooding at the same time? So it's a matter of losing those in one, all your eggs in one basket. We're trying to stay away from that. So 
that's uh, a large a large part of our adoption process. Um, along like with the uh, Feed Appalachia project, it's it's all funded by myself. Um, I I don't make anything. There's no money to be made. It's it's a matter of getting our our seed family uh, back into the hands of of their original keepers, uh, back to their original homelands. Um, I prefer when um, <clears throat> people adopt that they try to adopt what is is uh, indigenous to their their climate to their area. Uh, in New York, you would look for the uh, Haudenosaunee and uh, you know the Oneida and and so on the Mohawk. Um, North Carolina, um, you know, the Cherokee, Oklahoma, even the Cherokee and Choctaw and, and so on. We try to keep things regional um, for those growers also that, that we can acclimate them uh, and, and maybe bring even back a lot of the genetic past back in back into play. Um, so we, we have those projects. Um, I also um, collect just other varieties. Um, it doesn't have to be vegetable varieties. We I have more flowers, actually, than I have anything. Um, we, we've probably got uh, over 4,000 varieties of corn. And every single one of our corn is non-GMO, non-hybrid. These are... Some of them are ancient corn. Some of the most, like the Chevalote corn, is some of the most ancient that exists. And they're, you know, all from the Oaxaca Valley um, of Mexico. So a lot of Peruvian corn. And what you get with a lot of those seeds um, is you really have to know what you're doing. Um, they have um, a daylight issue with their growing. For instance, uh, they have a very long season. They have a different climate. So most of those seeds won't produce for a normal gardening season here. So there's, there's a lot of tricks. They won't germinate in light, for instance. They have to be left in the dark. Um, and some of the Peruvian corn is 20 and 30 feet tall. And we're talking cobs that are a foot and a half, two foot long easy um some of some of the actual kernels are bigger than a quarter so it's very very unique varieties um that are often uh, unless like i said you know what you're doing it, it can be difficult but um i do want to talk today with mark and others about um you know even even your common backyard gardener um there is no reason that seed saving cannot uh, be a, a huge part of your uh, gardening experience and um, you know there, there's a lot of um, issues for instance with I, I know with with new gardeners uh, ones that that love doing it too especially uh, get overexcited so they'll pick 50 varieties of tomatoes to start out with and each one of those, they'll, they'll grow a hundred plants up. So, and all of a sudden, they, you know, they're very overwhelmed. So um, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, in and outs to seed saving, I would say. Um, where, where are most of, uh, of our Zoom people from? I know I had one, uh, Obviously, Ohio and Chris McHugh's Connecticut. Um, are we from all over the United States? Or are we out of the United States? I'm New York. New York. Well, New York. We're, Another. we're trying to, um, for those who are able to anyway, uh, that 
possibly could help us with their adoption process, especially. Um, like I mentioned with the um, feed Appalachia, we, we're looking for just um, regular gardeners that may want to take um, a basil, a basil variety, for instance, or just a common heirloom tomato and grow it. And let's say that they grow a little bit more than they're going to use. Now we're, we're talking about seed. So, you know, you, you can all you can um, and process it. And uh, maybe some have value added products that they make or whatever, but you know, you, we don't have to have huge growers to help in what we're doing. Um, it can be just simple, just a simple cucumber that you want to try. And if you have an, an you know, an extra amount of seed, send it our way because it, it goes into the households of thousands of um, families that are in need. Um, Mark, what would you like to discuss now? Yeah, that was a good uh, good introduction, Chris. Um, I think there's a lot of, I have a lot of questions. I'm sure other people do as well. Um, numerous things come to mind here. I think, you know, coming up with a system that, that uh, the people in BFA chapters uh, that are online, which I think most, most people here, um, how we can basically uh, help. And so, you know, other than, you know, um, I think the one way is to receive seeds and grow them out and return them and, and keep those uh, keep the pressure off of those rarer ones as much as we can. And I think people with smaller operations could also consider things that don't cross too easily and also make a lot of seeds per plant. You know, things like amaranths, for example, you know, one a few plants, you're going to have enough seeds for everybody. Um, I do think, though, we might want to um, <clears throat> address a couple questions. Uh, that are, I think, pretty relevant, which has to do with seed size. Like when you're growing seeds out, I mean, when you get down to the last couple of seeds, you're kind of in in trouble, depending on which kind of plant you're talking about. But um, wanting to have a, a a little bit of a a diversity in your in your seed selection of what you're saving, I noticed this. Uh, you mentioned corn. Um, that you don't really need to save that many ears to plant for the next year, but you want to save back a big enough sample to have enough diversity in it and that that might be something people um things like that also storage uh you know i know there's an endless amount of territory to get into with with seed saving and and um but maybe you could also a big one that jumps out to me in in this and and it came up in the conference when you had that that basket of corn um, that all of those varietals popped out in, who knows how many could have been hundreds of years later, uh, out of no, what seemingly nowhere, there there is this uh, all this genetic information that emerged that um, isn't real clear where it came from. And I know Reginaldo Haslett Marroquin had mentioned about the creation stories of corn in Central America and had some. Uh, but I forget it was like grandmother corn or or some. So to me, what this points to, and, and I want you to tell that story, but but what it points to is that when you are in a semi-triage type situation where uh, you have limited resources and time, it seems like maybe we should be focusing on the the varieties that have the most genetic variety within them some of the land races and rainbow corns and and that we could, you know, if, if you're down to just a, whatever you can fit in your kayak or in your braids, and you know, when you're traveling uh, to another country, uh, it seems like the, the strategy would be to, to make sure we, we keep those, those ancient land races that contain maybe all of the other varieties, you know, it's just a matter of work to get them back out, but you can't get that information out of a hybrid or a GMO variety. So there's a couple things there, but maybe you could address size of seeds, uh, how much seed to save to keep it from going into an inbreeding 
problem. Uh, and two, mention the story about that Peruvian corn, because uh, yeah. it's kind of amazing. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I had was discussing a lot about the, the seeds with the quantity amount. So uh, one of the unfortunate problems that I run across with, with specifically corn, let's say, is that um, you have to have, um, I'm going to say 50, which is the low end, to 100 seed to be able to grow it and it not be become inbred, um, which of course changes the corn and it dies out, etc. So a lot of problems arise with indigenous corns because they've not been grown in so long. So a lot doesn't germinate. Um, the USDA, for instance, has a has a huge bank uh, also that is um, full of these varieties that that you can uh, adopt out um, or take out whatever. And um, and a lot of times, you know, they don't they don't germinate. Um, now, the one of the issues with that. Uh, I always try if I if I adopt any corn out from our um, bank, we always try to give at least seventy five to hundred seeds. Um, and with pollination, I always tell people to try and do, you know, six foot uh, by six foot blocks of corn, um, close. Um, pollination is it's just better better that way instead of long long rows you, know, you get more uh, pollination um also it can it can, uh, also it can be easier as far as uh hand pollinating sometimes small blocks versus such large uh sections of uh garden um so mark had had said you know was talking about things popping up um very unique characteristics genetically pop up within especially indigenous varieties and um one one thing that we have a lot of is what they call grandmother corn now um there's several types of corn i'm not sure who is familiar with this but there is uh you know flint corn there is flower corn um Etc. So one of one of the types of corn is called pod corn. Now, technically, from my understanding, anyway, um, our earliest corn relative was Tiacenti, which is a is probably a two foot um, grass that that has these triangular seeds, and that's what corn uh, eventually came from. Um, so between that and our, our earlier corn varieties, we have what is called pod corn. Um, maybe some of you have seen it, maybe not. It's, it's very unique to where when you have the cob of corn, each individual kernel has its own husk. So instead of one husk covering the entire cob, each individual kernel has its own husk, which is, is called a gloom. But um, so it's, it's not necessarily <laughs> grown for eating because if you can imagine trying to uh, unhusk a thousand, you know, on one, <laughs> on one, um cob of corn so it, it it is not used for that um within pod corn itself there are some that that have no glooms over each one at all it's just a, a common looking uh cob of corn but within it you know within its uh dna you have these these um husked gloomed pod corns that will come out so in a lot of our more ancient corn a lot of our indigenous corns will grow 
and every once in a while there'll be a, a grandmother corn uh, again talking matrilineal here a, a grandmother corn will will pop out amongst all the other uh, corn in the field now most would would take that out um but actually what what we do is we leave it first off um and one of the reasons we do that comes into um cultural um reasons for instance um those corn are are often used as as a part of divination um for instance if if you've got um just your common uh flint corn and a pod corn just pops out of nowhere it's it's telling you with with indigenous traditions anyway it's telling you that there is a bad winter coming because you've got it that is multiple husked um also an, another thing is if if you have a a, a a cob of corn that is double husked you know it's telling you that you better prepare for winter uh, it's a it's a matter of divination it's like um if an eight row corn becomes a 10 row corn you find a 10 row corn well that's telling you, you better save more than what you you know than what you would normally save um it's like woolly worms you know woolly worms and Appalachia, you know black and and brown whether the winter is going to be bad or persimmon seeds that are cut in half to see whether there's a fork or a knife or a spoon whether you'll be shoveling snow or the wind will cut you in half you know it's it's all a matter of cultural divination so that that goes back millennia but pod corn is one of those things that pops up that helps us with that um so the peruvian corn um like like the pod corn um has a lot of ancestors in it it's you you've got to imagine this little minuscule um little minuscule box or or treasure chest and inside of it is millennia of information we're talking about what our ancestors did 2000 years ago in that particular area of the world with with their gardening with their agricultural techniques it's in that seed so when it is is harvested now sometimes our ancestors pop their head up so you have you have a particular variety of of let's say um, um, gourd seed corn. I'm not I'm not sure who is familiar with that, but but each kernel is pointed and, and curled. It it um, uh, some call it tooth corn, it uh, squirrel corn. It's different different names, but so you can say you're growing that and then all of a sudden <laughs> when you start harvesting it and you and you know for a fact that every year prior to that there's not been any contamination that's the thing is is with corn you know to save seed um to preserve it it, it needs to be isolated bees travel three to five miles period now that's straight line distance, but you know, still, um, you you need to be isolated and hand pollinate when it comes to saving pure varieties. Um, as far as just for your own personal use, um, just don't. I wouldn't suggest growing near a GMO cornfield. Period. Um, anything that's grown from that I, I suggest incineration because it's bred in it there is nothing that can get that out nothing so um when when saving a lot of these seeds um you have these things pop out for instance and what mark was uh, talking about uh, earlier was um there was a particular peruvian corn um it's just jet black and the even the usually with if, if you've ever noticed with colored corns red blue 
when you break the kernel, the inside is white. Well, with this particular corn, this Peruvian corn, it's solid black. It's used to make um, different drinks. Um, it can be used as a sweet corn or, or a dried flower corn. But so you have this jet black ancestral corn and you've grown it and grown it and grown it. And then all of a sudden one year, <laughs> you've got 10 to 12 different types of corn pop out. And what I mean by that is you've got a, a row of that black corn and in that row, you've got a popcorn. And then the row after that, you've got a white flower corn. After that, maybe you might find um, gourd seed. And I mean, it's all different colors and all different kinds also that will come out from that genetically and uh it's it's really an amazing thing that um seeds can not only preserve you know um our how can i say our involvement in their growth but but also they preserve of course their genetics and all things that have been grown in with them and pollinated and and um, crossed with them now with indigenous varieties we're <clears throat> something with you know we were speaking uh, mark was with resiliency and things that, that we need to grow as far as um acclimated to ourselves our own in regional environments so a lot of people don't realize but indigenous varieties have i mean we've done that for millennia for thousands of years um you've grown 20 different squash that um let's say you know are, are all able to be you know they're all machada or they're all um maxima varieties or or whatever species but they can all be crossed and you just grow them together for decades and you save, you know, those that let's say that the area floods, well, what survives it? Don't look at what, that's what a lot of gardeners have trouble with is they look, Oh man, I've lost everything. Well, actually you've got a little bitty row right there of corn that just held on and looks like it's producing great. So the rest doesn't matter. Collect from those things that that give us these gifts, you know, within our own environment. Um, and indigenous varieties, uh, land races, for instance, are are an amazing, amazing thing. Um, there's one particular squash a friend of mine um, grows, and it's the nanocoke squash. This is from the Nanakoke people in the east. Um, and this particular squash you can grow and it, it'll, let's say it'll be a, a gray squash about this big. Well, when you, when you, somebody, let's say, gives you that squash, you look at it, you take the seed and you plant it. Well, when you plant it, all of a sudden you've got 10, <laughs> 10 varieties of squash that come out of that one seed. So, you can grow them and it's, and it's the same thing. And it's just things that have, have lasted uh, for, for thousands of years that um, the seeds know what they're doing. You know, that's, that's the thing. Nature knows what it's doing. Sometimes we don't, but um, so that's, that's the fun about land races is um, with seed keepers too. You know, there's, there's ones that are pre, um, preservationists like myself that um, it's, it's really a matter of life and death of the plant, the species, that things are kept absolutely pure, hand-pollinated, um, isolated. And that way, that particular example is saved because you never know in the future, you know, um, 
a, a new disease may come out that that particular variety is you know would would save us from you know it it doesn't um it's not accept, uh, susceptible to it um you never know um but also it's a matter of the history you know preserving history but um with other varieties, I tell a lot of gardeners, you know, grow what makes you feel good. Grow what makes you happy. If you if you love a particular, um, just a mix of tomatoes, grow the mix of them. Don't be concerned with keeping things pure. Uh, and and I do I do warn about GMOs and and hybrid etc that that's a separate subject i'm speaking about growing for yourself in a in a healthy natural environment so you know who who cares if this squash crosses with that one because it's it's really a like christmas you <laughs> next year you plant these seeds and all of a sudden you've got something that that nobody else has got nobody else has seen and it's new and you know that's that's part of the fun of it it's breeding if you want to go down that route um but but definitely um grow what is going to help sustain you i know um i have traveled all over the place and <clears throat> have saved seed save seed save seed and when in the very end of it i found out you know that I was really the one being saved because um, it's it's a connection. Uh, it's like Chris McHugh, you know, and Mark. Known them for a very long time now, and they're they're seed family, <laughs> same as the seeds. And you know those those things we have these connections with people that. Uh, normally we would not get and seeds seeds are, are things that connect us they connect us to other people to other places but also to our ancestors and things that we should know but we don't know so it's a learning process so i'm i'm hoping that that um, more people will will be involved in in growing their own gardens i know um I'm a beekeeper also, and I hear all the time, you know, well, why don't you have 50,000, you know, why don't you have 50,000 hives? And I said, well, I would rather have one hive for 50,000 people than, you know, 50,000 to one person. These, these giant um, honey producers out West have 40, 50,000 hives and they they move them and they um pollinate different orchards etc with them um and that's that's a lot like seeds too you know it's it's if we had more small farms small gardens there's more um communities and and really building up resiliency to things that are coming so um Mark, you got anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> well, you bring up some good points. I, I, I think the quality and quantity uh, piece is really important. Uh, and it, it plays out in everything that we do. And I, I think another thing is you're talking about growing things that you love. I've been looking at, I've been looking at gratitude as an input uh, more and more as time goes by. It's in my list of you know, I don't even use fertilizers, but minerals and inoculants, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's in there, right? So there, there's this relationship in there and it's all relational. It's all kin at the end of the day. It's not kingdoms, but it's more kingdoms. Um, and the uh, Alan Capular had put together some relational maps of the world's flora and uh, used those terms. I thought that was very useful. Um, 
I suppose we should open up to some other questions. Uh, I have plenty of others and 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 can easily keep things going, but I want to make sure that other folks who have questions can um, can get in on this. And uh, that I find that that usually takes us in the direction that we need to go anyway. Um, so uh, I don't know, Shauna, do you want to field questions or just let people chime in or how do you want to do it? Sure, we can use the the chat unless, um, depending on how many people are going to jump right in. I did have um, a question and I know, well, first of all, Chris, this is amazing. This I love how you tell the story and um, just the idea. And I'm thinking of the things that have popped up on the farm that I've cut down thinking, you silly goose, where are you coming from? Shame, shame. I know it's like... <laughs> You know, all like you, there's so many things that you said, like what, you know, nature knows what we don't know and how and and all of that. But another thing that popped up in my mind when you're talking about people getting involved is I don't know if other people are noticing this, but we have a this new agriculture thing in Denver. I'm not even going to name it, but I went to go and visit and it was supposed to be teaching children and communities about agriculture. And I walked away furious because what it did is made it look like you needed to have so much experience or so much money or so much knowledge to even get your foot in the door. Like they had the hydroponic this and they had the rooftop this with the special clay baked soil. And I left there thinking I would never dare plant a garden if this is how I thought, you know, you had to start. So one of my things um, that I've had with seed saving is I used to be overwhelmed by this idea. If I have to ferment the tomato seeds in this special vat and I got to where I would take my favorite tomato, I'd smear it on a paper towel and throw it in the freezer. And those are my seeds for next year. Like, is there, are there simple steps that I know, and I know you talked about, you know, plant something you love, but is there kind of like the the gateway seed saving that would be really easy for people to get on board? I'll say that, and then I will then do the, the chats. Okay, so um, really, um, seed saving is, is one of those things that, of course, you know, you do not have to be this um botanist or this or this professional to do it. and that's that's a problem with a lot and there's a big misconception on gardening to begin with um that you've got to have a huge um plot of land and and you've got to have a tiller and all this stuff you know there, there's no there's no till gardens there's container gardens there's you know upright gardening there, there is a million different ways to garden in every spot on the planet. So it, it's just a matter of what you're willing to do, what you want to do. What, what do you want to accomplish? You know, are you a family of five that, that wants to feed yourself every single day? Or are you one of those that would just like to have a nice tomato sandwich on a summer day every once in a while? You know, it really, it really depends on what, each individual wants um simple simple little things to do well um a lot of people uh, are worried about um they they worry about anyway seeds uh, rotting especially in in areas with a lot of rain so one of the things i always suggest with that especially with beans is once once they start getting dry you can see them pull the whole plant up don't pull the beans off pull the whole plant root and all and if you've got a garage you know this it helps with things like this or a porch but um first of all i, I figure if you're going to grow um a big enough plot where you can pull up beans you're you'll probably have a place to put them if you need to but you pull these beans up, plant and all, and hang them. 
the beans continue to pull nutrients from the rest of the plant and the roots, see, and that keeps the seeds maturing. Then they dry. So when they're when they're dry and it's not raining and you have time to, you know, winnow winnow them. You know, you know, put them all in a in a five gallon bucket or a or a mop bucket. Stomp on them. Have have your kid, you know, get in there and just stomp the crap out of them. I mean, then they they get to see what they you know they've done. I know. Um, with kids especially, um, it, it always amazes me going to schools. Um, I'd set up a, a seed saving curriculum and, um, and everything for, um, it's kind of like a, a curriculum, but also a seed starting uh, gardening and, and um, seed bank curriculum for school systems especially here in Kentucky I've got a lot that that are already uh, using it have been using it for years now and um, some of the schools produce all the food you know for for that school so you know we're talking about a lot of kids a lot of mouths to feed but one one of the programs with that um, is actually is is forming clubs etc you can even get help with you know like your um that school district's ffa you know future farmers of america that that one of their credits is tending this garden during the summer that's the problem with a lot of school systems so it's like nobody is there who's gonna who's gonna tend this you know well there are ways around that. Um, but I, I've been to a lot of uh, apartment complexes. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, about uh, dwarf varieties and stuff like that, that, that literally you can, you can have tomatoes that are, you know, a bush this tall that produce plenty for yourself, you know. Um, but I've found that kids really are are the key to a lot of of, of future future growing and seed saving. Adults seem like um, you know it, it's hard to get them on on board with a lot of stuff because life is very difficult. Life is busy, so it's a matter of making things easier for yourself. So, like like I was saying, it it depends on what particular um plan that you have um can i quit ask you a question about hanging the beans did yeah. you mean upside down or right side up well you you can take them right by the roots and just hang them up but just, but the other roots up or down it, it doesn't matter as, oh. as, <laughs> as long as as they're whole you know it's it's still going to travel it's still going to pull nutrients from the actual vine. So you could even lay it on a rack kind you of You could, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, um, a lot of times what I would do, um, we've been farming around and we're, we're in the mountains. So I can literally look and I can tell about down to 30 seconds or so when rain is going to hit us i can see it and i know i've got so many minutes to do whatever i need to do before it starts raining so that's one thing you know that i'm, I'm glad where we're at but we i've been out here and we've um, just grabbed as many beans plants as we could and we've just tied them all together and just hung them up on a porch. Um, so, it, so go ahead. I was gonna say, that's great. And I like the idea of incorporating the kids. I know my kids have always, you know, like anytime they open up those pods, depending on which bean, you know, I say it's like Easter, like they're beautiful. And yeah, you know, like jewels. Yeah. 
We had uh, another question from Ellen. Um, if we're going to grow out seeds, do you pair us with seeds that make sense for our region? And how do we get seeds? Like how, how can people okay. participate? Okay, so <clears throat> I had mentioned earlier about, you know, um, acclimating seeds to your region, especially those where um, uh, Miss Best here is in New York. Um, I would definitely try and send her mohawk seeds, um, seeds that are that are native, and in in native to the point where they're they're from those indigenous people of that area. Um, but sometimes that's that just doesn't happen. Sometimes I have a a, a really responsible grower from Connecticut, let's say. Um, where I need um, a variety from Florida grown. And sometimes it just has to happen. Um, but you also have to realize these seeds, a lot of them have not, have not been grown um, by their native people anyway in 200 years. We're, we're talking seeds that have been displaced um, some that have been inherited by outside families, you know, uh, and been uh, gone all over the place. That that ponca seed I, I mentioned earlier, um, I was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee in a candle shop. And I was just looking through candles and this little uh, elderly German lady standing next to me. <clears throat> and I don't know why, probably gardening or something. We started talking. Um, and I like to talk, so it's it's easy, easy, easy to, to get in touch with people that way. But so I was speaking with her, and uh, she had mentioned that her neighbor had this bean that he had grown for years and hadn't grown it in forever, and it was in his freezer. And he was German, a German family from North Dakota. Well, long story short, that bean made its way from that retiree's freezer in Florida in that aluminum um, pouch that was dated 1987. That was the last time it was grown. And that was 2005 when I spoke to that lady. So I'd got those seeds that had been frozen in that freezer that long. Well, before that, um, <clears throat> before 87, it was, it was no telling, maybe 20 years since it had been grown. So we're talking uh, a bean that for the past, you know, century has only been grown a couple times. Um, amazingly, that German family was, uh, I don't want to say married into, but was a part of the original Ponca that had been um, moved from Nebraska into the Dakotas and so forth and so on, back and forth. And they lived right at the, um, the fort and reservation. So originally there was um, a bean, a squash, and a corn the squash and the corn no longer exists. Um, it is gone. So that bean is the only known bean for those Ponca people in the world. And it was hiding out in a retiree's um, freezer in Florida. So that just goes to show, you know, that, that they don't have to be from the region, but I, I prefer them to. But sometimes uh, growers, good growers are just, you get what you can take, you know, because it's that's a matter a, of saving. That's a great lead into this next question from Ethan. Um, would you go into what you consider when looking for responsible growers? And if you were to put together a toolkit, both literally and skill set, what would be included? Well, one being in the BFA, that's a pretty good start. I mean, um, you're talking about, you know, natural growing and nutrients in the soil and soil health and good gardening practices. Um, 
a lot of times, <clears throat> you know, um, I have to take a chance. Um, sometimes the adoptees, I, I don't, I don't know that well. So it's, it's a matter of, you know, um, getting advice from other people like, well, you know, I trust these people. Well, then they become adoptees. You know, it's really, um, a lot of people, what I've found honestly is, is they don't want the responsibility because it is responsibility. They don't want that on their shoulders. They, they feel like, well, if I mess up, if I mess up, you know, it may be gone and they, they just cannot, they don't have the heart to even try. Well, it's definitely going to be gone if you don't. So that's where I've got thousands of years weighing down on me that I've got to get these seeds planted. I've got to get them back to their homes. So as far as credentials, you know, it's just if you have good gardening practices and you're not a, a Monsanto GMO troll, then, yeah, I'll probably give you seeds to to plant um so as far as where to get the seeds um usually uh, uh, you contact me through my email um which i can i can give to anyone they they would like or um we also have i think um the rematriation project has a gofundme so if, for instance, uh, you don't want the responsibility of growing, but you still want to help us, the GoFundMe is a great way to do that. Um, funding, um, like I said, I, it's all out of my own pocket. So uh, a lot of times um, good friends and, and other things get me to places um, like BFA conferences, for instance, or um other seed venues and organic farm conferences and and just uh, mother earth news fairs and wherever um to try and get the word out and um so i'm i'm always in need of of uh the financial help but as far as growing and adopting seed um you can email me and I'm happy to talk things over with you, uh, even on uh, Facebook. You know, you can look me up and message me through there, if possible. Um, but we talk about it, and we I find out where you're from and what experience you have. You know, like if you've only grown tomatoes, then I'm, I'm probably going to give you some rare tomatoes to grow. Um, or some beans that are not necessarily as rare as as some and that's where a lot of like what i was talking about with the feed appalachia program um they don't have to be rare i mean i give you the seed um let's say that that uh, you you come to me and you say well um my husband and i our kids we want to grow um, a tomato, a cucumber, a bean, a squash, and maybe a corn or something. So I just handpick heirloom varieties that are good for your region, that are great producers, that are prolific, that, you know, are just really easily grown varieties. And I give them to you and you grow them and you Part of it you keep for yourself. The other part you send back. Simple as that. And then when I get the seed, I package it. And then I hand hand out uh, packets wherever. Um, right now, like I'd said, it, it had started actually as part of uh, the flood uh, displacement in our, in our region. Um, Southeast Kentucky, we, I think last year we lost 40 people to flooding. Um, and that's, that's the people who passed away, not people who lost their homes. 
That's just the people who died. So I, I don't have that number. It's a big one, though. But um, state of emergency, emergencies being called, et cetera. So um, people trying to get back on their feet. It started in eastern Kentucky. And now um, I hand out seed in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia. And um, if I go to any other place like Connecticut or, or wherever, a New York, um, I give seed there too. It doesn't have to be Appalachian. Um, you know, I, it's, it's just a matter of giving seed out. You know, hopefully people are, are as excited about uh, growing all these varieties as as I am so that's that's a big part of it too you know um, right. I've got um, a few more things here yeah uh, Lori was asking have you or others done any work with native tribes she's in Connecticut uh, Mohegan Pequot and Eastern Pequot territory uh, yeah I've got um, uh, I don't know exactly how many varieties I have uh but I, I have quite a few of those uh, and they're, they're in the process of actually being re re rematriated right now. I have a few um, that are ready to be rematriated, but then I've got a lot of others too that um, like with Chris McHugh, she's in Connecticut. So um, she's really helped me a lot with the Northeastern area. Also uh, Bill Braun, who is a, a fee, uh, Freed Seed Federation out of Massachusetts. Um, we've uh, been able to rematriate to the Wampanoag people um, already. We have rematriated seeds to, um, gosh, there's just a huge list of them in the Northeast that we've, that we've already been able to rematriate. Um, there's um, also, uh, and I wanted to speak about this while I while I had a second and I thought of it. Um, it a lot of the uh, varieties that go hand in hand with the indigenous collection is uh, African American slave varieties. I have got uh, varieties that are hundreds of years old that have been passed down through uh, slave families and free men. And um, a lot of times in, in those time periods, um, you had tribes that would absorb slaves. And so a lot of times when they would bring seed over, uh, whether it was braided in their hair, uh, et cetera, from Africa, you know, Western Africa, they would bring these seed over and through Georgia and, and Mississippi and Louisiana, you had all these parishes and plantations that were growing these seeds, okra, for instance, okra, um, cow peas, et cetera. Now I've, I've been able to um, save quite a few of those varieties and Melungeon varieties uh, also. Uh, matter of fact, there's several um, places right now, um, Ujama seeds uh, have got a couple of varieties of, of mine that have been saved. Um, I think there's a, a Zale fisheye cowpea. That, that came from uh, uh, the Azale family. Um, also, you know, the Catawba uh, Freeman okra. That was um, a very old variety that, that has been saved and now it is available, you know, um, to everyone publicly. So um, every year I try to release, um, I try to release a hundred to two or 300 varieties every single year, um, which, you know, that may sound like a lot, but in, but in honesty, um, it's not because you've got six over 6,000 just in the indigenous collection that, 
that I'm that I'm trying to work on. And and when you when you do seed save, you've got to realize that seeds also have a shelf life. The way you store them matters. You know, everybody tells you dark, um, cool. That's okay. But if you really want to keep them and keep them a long time, freeze them. Wrap them in aluminum. Well, put them in plastic, then wrap them in aluminum foil. The reason aluminum foil is so good is because, one, it keeps the moisture the seed had in it in it. Also, it keeps any excess moisture out or like freeze drying that happens naturally so when you when you put herbs for instance in the freezer if you leave them long enough they're dried i don't know if you know this or not but they're they're naturally freeze dried they're preserved so that happens with seed too well seed if if it's not protected it will die it's a living thing so i suggest wrapping them in aluminum foil and just like from personal experience, some they'll they'll last decades. Um, but freezing seed can turn a bean seed that that you would have for two to five years into ten and twenty years, and that's just that's commonplace. That's not something out of the ordinary. Um, Chris, I have a, another question here from Chris McHugh. And she was asking, are there any seed swaps coming up that you will attend so people can come and meet you and other seed people and acquire some seeds there? Yeah, that's something I was going to mention too, is the seed swaps. Um, you know, um, I talked a little bit ago about connecting. And, you know, some people have passion, whether it's uh, tomatoes or, or they love beans or corn or whatever. Well, these seed swaps are, are just great because you, you go there and you become a part of this annual gathering. And it becomes a, a, like a family reunion. Um, it, it really changes you. It, it, it guides you into where you want to go as far as your seed saving, but it, it also, it also creates friendships and networking and connections, um, that are just invaluable. Um, the next seed swap is that, that I'll be attending, um, is in Pikeville, Kentucky, which is the, the easternmost county right next to West Virginia. And it's the Appalachian seed swap. Um, sometimes we'll have um, a thousand plus people come through there. You do not have to bring seeds if you if you don't have them. You you don't have to um, do any kind of trading or anything. A seed swap is you can go there and there are seed vendors you can buy from there are um people that just you know would like to trade they uh, let's say that you've got a, a wonderful calendula flower that you've been growing forever and you just got some extra seeds so you take them and you can take that little pack of seeds and you give out so much to this person for a, a new tomato you don't have then you give out some for this person and you've got a bean or another calendula or whatever, you know, it's a lot of uh, trading, but it's, it's a good way to get a lot of varieties free if you can't afford to buy them. Um, but also when you do buy them, you know, uh, you're helping these independent small farmers um, not only feet put food on the on the table for their families you know but but also continue the seed work and that that's a very important thing because um, 
seed saving, you know, in, in America anyway, most of our farmers are over 60 years old. That's the statistics. Uh, I'm, I'm, from what I've heard, I think they're 64 to 65 year old is the average age of the farmer across the U.S. Now, what do you think is going to happen when this group of farmers goes? It's, you know, it's, it's about youth. So it's a great thing for kids and uh, especially those with families, you know. But so the next seed swap is the Appalachian seed swap in Pikeville, Kentucky. And it is April the 6th coming up. It's a Saturday. Um, and if this tells you anything, um, usually what we do is, is we all come in on a Friday. We okay. meet. We have dinner. All the seed savers, all the vendors, we have dinner. Next day, we get up and we have breakfast together. Then we have the seed swap. And sometimes we only see these people once a year. Um, but like I said, it's great for networking. Um, usually there's not a lot of seed swaps in the summer. We are too busy gardening and farming to have a seed swap. But um, what I try to do is this year, uh, especially, <clears throat> I'll be hopefully traveling a lot and um, giving out seed. Giving out seed. Great. Uh, let's see, we had a couple more things coming in. I had a question. Uh, for Chris McHugh real quick. I don't know if you'd be able to add um, Chris's email to our chat. And then if you had information about that seed swap, I don't know. I just thought maybe you would. If you if you could put those in there, that would be great. Sure. Yep, I'll do that. Thank you. And then there was a question from Blake. And then I want to piggyback a question on there too. And then maybe Mark will have some, some follow-up questions. So this is from Blake. What about genetically diverse landrace seed? And do you catalog any land race populations? So those are two, and I'm going to throw one more in there as I've been really curious about the matriation process. Is that a ceremony? Like, how do you give the seeds back? So I, if you had a story about that, I'd love to hear that. But there were, so three questions in there I threw out all at once. Okay, okay. so... Um... The, the first question exactly was what about genetic? The um, what about genetically diverse land race seed? Do you catalog any land race populations? Okay, like, like I had said, a lot of your indigenous varieties are land race. So uh, an Appalachian too, like with a lot of livestock, you know, you have these breeds that have been land race breeds for for a century or so. Um. I, I do not do as much um, of the uh, land race and, and Greg's growing as far as um, acclimating and, and breeding and trying to cross and pick out specific varieties. My job has mainly been um, conservation, you know, preservation. Um, I do work with a lot of uh, varieties that are that have been I don't I don't want to say bred but naturally bred and uh, land race varieties that are are acclimated and great for your surroundings your region. So um, as far as our collection, yeah, I've got thousands of varieties like that. Um, but do I specifically um, focus on those? No, um, because I, I believe what, what I'm doing with, with preserving things from extinction, automatically the, the genetics and everything that are in those seed are, have been proven for millennia, especially with indigenous varieties. I mean, there's a reason they still exist, you know, um, but we, I, I work with a lot of different people. 
um, there's Nate Kleinman, and he uh, has a uh, environmental uh, experimental farm network. Um, you can buy a lot of our, our uh, seed through him also. Um, also, there is um, like the Ujama seed. Um, but uh, people like Chris Smith, which I'm not uh, sure if you're familiar with him, but he, he is a uh, James Beard Award winning uh, fellow. Uh, he's from England. He's a great guy. And he is an mm -hmm. okra expert. And one of the, the okra that I'm responsible for saving in, in our collection is called a Moody, the Moody family okra. Well, this okra, uh, come to find out, is an extremely rare species of okra that is, is unlike most others. It's a West African variety um, that, that very few varieties exist out there of it. And um, so it was very neat when you have this little round okra seed and then you plant it and find out, oh, wow, you know, it's something that um, is very rare uh, beyond its historical um, rareness and, and, you know, that. So um, within that, it's just amazing to look and see um, how seeds, their journeys. You know, they'll, they'll go from places like uh, I've got peppers from Haiti that have, have come over and, and, and settled through uh, Florida, uh, Louisiana, through different uh, parishes there. Um, and it's just amazing to see um, the story of seeds and the journey and where they come from and especially where they're going. And that's what's amazing, too, about a lot of the indigenous varieties um, is once they grow, you know, again, in their native homeland, it's, it's almost like, um, excuse the, the pun, but they bloom, they blossom. They, they're almost um, a different creature. It's like they've been held captive and it's like they know the soil. They know the earth. And that's, you know, one of the biggest blessings in what I do is, is not just to see um, a specific species goes, go back to its people, <clears throat> but also its, its homeland, you know. Now, we've rematriated quite a bit of seed. Uh, one, particular, um, one particular variety was a sweet corn. And it is a, it's multicolored. It is a blue, uh, white, and it's purple. Uh, it's, it's very beautiful. And it's called a blue pulling corn. Now, this corn is from the Lenape people of um, Delaware up through into New Jersey, et cetera. Now, um, this corn had been um, lost for a very long time and was given to me uh, years ago. And I finally was able to get it out and grow it. And uh, I had give it to a friend, adopted it, uh, Nate Kleinman, who I had spoke of earlier with the Experimental Farm Network. And um, so, I was contacted by a guy uh, named Vincent Mann, which he's a wonderful fellow. He just happens to be one of the chiefs in the Lenape people, the um, Rapapo um, Lenape. So he had created um, the Three Sisters Medicinal Garden, I believe is, is the name of it. Um, and they actually had started growing it again. Um, a lot of times what I try to do is, uh, yes, yeah, ceremonially, um, culturally, you know, um, I try to always send seeds, um, not, not just 
um, with tobacco and sweetgrass, sage, et cetera, you know, uh, indigenous holy uh, plants, et cetera, but, um, but also as, as, an, as an offering to the people um, back to them. Because, you know, these, these are seeds that, that are borrowed. They're, we don't own seeds, you know. And that, that's another part, too, is I, don't, I do not sell seed. I sell my work in seed, the packaging, et cetera. Um, and really, I, I don't profit really any from that. Um, it's just a matter of, of getting the seed back home. So the lovely thing is that pulling corn was finally rematriated. And because of health issues, I, I was not uh, able to attend. But they there was ceremonial gatherings, and and now the corn is is finally being grown by the people who who've always grown it, you know, and it's back home. So uh, I know Nate. Now I have a strict policy with their adoption: is you do not sell. The seeds you can give them you know but you do not sell them um so nate with with vincent mann it's actually they had they had decided to let um the seed go public and so they were selling it within the experimental farm network and all and like 50 percent of the profits we're going to that medicinal garden and um, other, other profits were going to the Lenape people. So it, it was a very good thing. You know um, it's, it's putting food ironically um, back in the hands of people, um, maybe even through um, the profits and things that are made, you know, helping, helping people back out. Um, so it's it's good that um, that we're that we're able to be a part of that, and that's that's what's exciting is to invite um, other people to be a part of it, to be able to adopt a seed, and and I I'll, I will say this I'm I'm I've, I've got several several books uh, written but uh, this particular one I'm, I'm, I'm writing at the moment is about this uh, rematriation process and it's about their journeys uh, the seeds journey our journey with them and it is about those people who who have helped me like chris right. McHugh and uh you know mark cohen and then just different people who have been a part of this process and they've uh, been able to grow a specific variety and so it's like from birth, you know, back home, we, we get to be a part of that. And, and I'm trying to write um, a book encompassing all those amazing stories. So we'll see. It's, it's a long process, but hopefully, hopefully we can get, uh, get it done soon. Um, was there another question? I was going to see if Mark or Chris had any questions for you or specific things they were hoping you were going to mention. Yeah, I, I've got a few odds and ends. Uh, I think that that uh, talking of the provenance is probably the the rarest thing that that seed keepers are are capturing, and so that's that's an amazing piece of this. And and uh, I had mentioned in the last talk about Gary Paul Nabin his story about how the Appalachian region had quadrupled its seed varieties over a thirty or forty year period. About the stories that was that was really generating that success, and I think that's a really important piece. Um, and he was saying that it was really because of farmers markets and CSAs and the recipes that they go with. Those are also part of that 
that uh, cultural interaction that we're, that we're really talking about. Um, another thing, you, uh, the, the Cumberland Seed Commons gathering coming up in uh, in, Kentu in Berea, Kentucky on the uh, 20th to the 23rd uh, of April as well um, is another event that's worth <laughs> worth noting. Another idea is that seeds have microbiomes that that we don't really want to be, uh, you know, there are some people who will, um, you know, treat seeds to uh, to try to kill, you know, diseases and things. And some of the fermentations do that selectively. Um, but again, uh, James White's work is showing that it's it's critical that some of the organisms that that come from the plant and the soil that the seed grew in stays in those seeds um, on those seeds. Um, just as a, another piece of this, um, you were talking about uh, hanging beans and and cleaning them, and I think that the uh, the innovation that happens on farms in general is interesting. But I'll, I'll tell you a quick funny story about beans. I was getting to the point where I was growing too many to do by hand, and I had gone up to. Uh, uh, Michigan to buy a combine, uh, one of these pull behind combines. And I was talking to the guy uh, about it. And he says, well, what are you doing now? And I said, well, <laughs> we took this old chicken plucker. And that, that was as far as I got. I mean, the guy burst out laughing. He knew exactly what, what we were doing. But basically, we took a chicken plucker with the rubber fingers that go around. We put a piece of plexiglass over it. And then we would hold the groups of dry beans plants in there that were had been hanging and the rubber fingers knocked them off. So it worked pretty well at a certain scale. But I think that uh, it's really a process of learning. And I, what I want to make sure that nobody listening uh, thinks is that this is too difficult or dangerous or risky to do. Um, I think maybe one idea about choosing who gets which seeds is that, you know, start with some things that aren't real rare, grow them out for a while, get move on to the more and more rare stuff, but make sure that this is an inclusive uh, story that everybody can get their hands in, every child can get their hands in, um, I think is an important message we don't wanna miss here, um, that you, you, there's no, you really almost can't fail in in a sense. You know, you're going to learn something, and the seeds are going to learn something by interacting with your place and you and uh, your community. Um, that was that might be that might be my main my main thing. I, I think that uh, finding ways to work together and networking is also a missing piece. I think that. Um, my troubles with going to different chapters and BFA chapters, I listened to a lot of stories. And uh, one of the big things that jumped out at me was that uh, almost every group, and these weren't even seed groups, but I think it, the same issue comes into play here is that, um, you know, the BFA chapters were meeting and up the road, there was a permaculture group and a Weston Price group and an organic group, and they're all in their little silos. And I think we need to get a lot better at networking between, you know, food producers and seed savers and um, seed banks, at, uh, food banks, et cetera. I think they're at uh, kind of an intersection between um, food banks and uh, food waste. There, because I inspect organic farms, I have come across some areas where there's amounts of food that's still good um but there's so much labor in dealing with it and separating it and so forth that there's this unique possibility of church groups that are involved in hunger and um seed banks and uh composters and chicken growers and so forth to get together and to pull together a a food security story that otherwise is slipping between our fingers and i, I think this idea that it, you know, and I'm very familiar with it, the, uh, the, that uh, people who show an ability wind up getting a huge amount of work heaped on their shoulders, usually by themselves, because they know why it's so important uh, that somehow as a community, we need to come together and lighten those loads on the people that have the heaviest load. I, there, I have a, I had a model where we had been 
carving out a dugout canoe in the jungle in Central America and it, you know, for weeks. And it finally got to the point where it was roughed out. Heavy, and it took about 20 people with ropes to pull this thing through the jungle to get back and and then carrying it on steep slopes. And there was enough people to carry it uh, comfortably on flat ground, but we got onto this slope and there would be a point where three quarters of the people would lose their footing and one quarter of the people were holding that load. And uh, anyway, there's these different, um, you know, ideas, but it, but this is really what's happening out there to a large degree is that we don't have uh, a distributed enough model for um, most everything important. And I think part of this work that we're talking about is building networks that get the important things done without burning out the 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 best among us. So and that, that that's definitely... kind of a it, it over sorry. No that that definitely is an issue. Um you you get a lot of people that um especially have done it their entire life depending on you know what it is and um it gets it gets to be too much and that's that's about where i'm at you know is that's why i'm i'm trying to reach out to a lot and um you know you had mentioned about um starting with something simple you know well we've got thousands of varieties of seeds thousands of different species so it does not have to be like i'd mentioned earlier just extremely rare or on the verge of extinction like i said it it can be just preserving a simple uh, family variety from appalachia or something or or just wanting to feed a particular group um, within your community um so I, I have, I've been, uh, people have reached out um, <clears throat> from Harlem to Brooklyn, all over um, these boroughs here and there to do community gardens and city gardens, rooftop gardens. And um, so I'm, I'm trying to, I was in Massachusetts not, not long ago and actually had spoke to a group um, that were wanting in, uh, I believe it was Detroit, to start a another um, community garden. And there's already a couple going there. Um, but yeah, starting small, it's it doesn't have to be overwhelming. Like I said, you, you need to find out where you want to start, what you're willing to do, what you want to be the end result. You know, um, with seed saving, it's in gardening um it's it's all fun until it becomes work <laughs> you know everybody it's it's a hobby or it's fun but the minute it comes work they want to drop it so it's a matter of keeping that spirit in it uh starting off small something simple that that is is for you for your family for a neighbor um i've had people um that that cannot stand tomatoes hate them but they're growing them because their elderly neighbor can't so that's that's a lot of what we were discussing too with networking and communities and food ways you know it's it's a matter of bringing back um essential human goodness back in with seed saving um as far as, um, you know, a lot of with the Appalachia stuff, the reason uh, you were talking about um, Haven's work and stuff, it's, um, you, you have to understand that within Appalachia, and this is what most people don't realize, is you, you had a physical mountainous barrier between one part of, an, of the nation to the other. And you finally had these these little gateways. Uh, one is very close to me. It's um, uh, Cumberland Gap. It's where um, Daniel Boone and, and uh, Dr. Um, Walker came in. And that was uh, the gateway to the West. You know, well, you have these communities, um, these families that have been isolated for a century or two. So you have 
um, tomatoes that, that may have came from gardens in Europe, in Russia, that have come over. Um, you have a, a lot of turmoil in other parts of the world and people, you know, migrate. Um, like a lot of the German Russians that came over in the 1800s that settled um, right around in with the Ponca and other places in North Dakota and Nebraska and out West. And you have all these different, this melting pot of people. But one thing that makes Appalachia so unique is that we have these mountainous um, towns and valleys. And throughout, I, I've noticed traveling anyway, I've got a big, bit of a, a Southern um, country uh, brogue or dialect, if you would. But, um, and sometimes that, sometimes they poke at me a little bit, you know, um, you know, joke a little bit about, I may say a word that, um, <laughs> that's just funny to them. But the funniest and most ironic part about it is, is that our language in Appalachia is the oldest form of English that still exists. And a lot of people don't realize that. Um, a lot of of, of the language that is spoken daily here in Appalachia has been isolated for a century or two. So you have settlers and other, other um, people that have made their way into the mountains and these various families have, have stayed there. So their language has been preserved as well as plants, heirlooms, you know, and their, their way of life and, like uh, a lot of people, and I, I'm curious with this this panel, um, who would know what leather breeches are? No idea. I, I think Chris McHugh. I think Mark may. Is it later hosing or something? Oh no, you don't see that. There we go. Well, <laughs> leather breeches is where you have um, the greasy bean, for instance. So we were talking about preservation, you know, and we were talking about, um, it was asked about, you know, pulling the beans up and, and keeping them uh, dry to be able to, you know, harvest the seed without them ruining from uh, the weather, from humidity. Well, we also have the matter of, of keeping food for ourselves for a long period of time. This involves uh, um, everything from like taking a, 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 a stoneware, a crock. And a lot of people like with eggs don't realize that eggs don't have to be refrigerated. In Europe, they don't refrigerate eggs. <clears throat> but you can take these eggs and as long as you leave what, what is called the bloom on them, that's where it's a protective coating the hen puts on the egg um, that keeps anything, eggs are porous. So anything that's outside of them goes in them. So you take this, this egg and you put lard, shortening, fat, in the bottom of this stone crock you lay the eggs in there none of them touching pour more fat over it and you keep layering them up 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 and away well that lasts over a year so you know that that happens with tomatoes too you can take tomatoes uh, like i love fried green tomatoes that's a southern thing not sure if you know about them but mm -hmm. you take, uh, you know, your green tomato. Now there's two, there's two kinds of green tomatoes. There's a green tomato that is ripe when it is green. And then there is a, a red tomato that is green and not ripe. So you want the one that is not ripe. That's, that's the one you would 
you would cook. So you slice this tomato up, and then the same crock, you put salt down. Then layer your tomatoes around, salt, tomatoes on up. They'll last over winter. So what you do is when you get them back out, you they're going to be salty. So you put them in water, let them soak, dump it, more water, dump it until you're you're happy with the amount of salt in the tomato. But then you can take them and dry them off and dip them in batter and fry them and there, there you go. Now, I was talking about leather bridges. <laughs> so leather bridges is um a type of it's a preservation method for beans. So you take your greasy beans. Um and I, and I want to say this real quick. We were talking about real quick with networking and connections. And you had talked about, Mark, about um, simple, keeping things simple. Uh, sometimes instead of like the winnowing, you know, or using different things, it's best to do them by hand and, and do them with your grandparents, do them with your aunts and uncles, do them with your kids or grandkids or whoever, because um you know in the end it's it's those when you're kids you think it's nothing but chores and you're sick of it 90 degrees on a porch you know uh, stringing beans and it gets aggravating but when you look back on it those connections that were made over over beans and seeds last longer than anything else so back to the leather britches in preserving them you you would want to string them then break them in half. So when you break them in half, you just put them in a basket. Then you need to take needle and thread and you double over the thread. You start with your bean and go up through. So if you have your bean here like this, you would go up this way, not through the end of it, but through the middle of it. So then you would just layer them like this, needle and thread up through them. So you would hang them, do not hang them in the direct sunlight because it, it, it just ruins them. If they get too hot, too quick, but you need a cool, dry, breezy place. Hang them up for a few weeks and they have a consistency of like leather, like they're tough, you know? Well, you may have heard shuck beans, shucky beans. Have you ever heard of that expression name? Well, that that is what they become. So you would take the beans, once they're dried and preserved, you'd take a handful, however many you want. You soak them overnight. So like with the tomatoes, you empty the water out, put more beans in, more water. Um, so after that, then you would boil them till they're cooked. You would add uh, hog jaw or bacon or fat back or whatever you want to use as a flavoring, which <clears throat> the, the good part about greasy beans and the reason they are so sought after is they already have a meat flavor. They're very hearty. So sometimes you don't, you don't have to add that, but, but anyway, so that it's a, it's a matter of preserving, preserving the beans. So, um, but yeah, in Appalachia, it's, it's, it's all about isolation. And that's the reason there are so many varieties. It's because if you take a 10 mile stretch of what we call holler, which is, is just a road that goes into a mountain, into a valley, um, you may have 10 families there. Well, each individual family may have their own tomato and their own bean. So, that can even happen within just, just a mile's length. So 
in one county, you could have thousands of varieties of this, of, of just tomatoes. And, um, you know, a lot of people would, would say, well, wouldn't they, wouldn't that just all be the same? Well, not really. Um, because different people have selected for different things over the years. So you may have one that, that, um, that liked the green tomato over the red or, or the size of it, or this may produce better than that or, or whatever, have a different taste. But, but um, it's very, it really is a specific and individual thing. So it's, it's amazing to be a part of a preservation like that. Well, this has been an incredible two hours. It flew by and I'm still like, wait, more stories, more like, tell me more. So um, thank you so much, Chris McHugh and Mark Cohen for organizing this. And Chris Hubbard, thank you so much. We had so many thank yous and round of applause from people listening in. This will be recorded and I'll share it with our chapters and chapter leaders. And want to encourage people to, you know, if chapters want to reach out and do this, reach out to Chris and then document and communicate with each other. I think that's a huge takeaway is do this with your families, do this with the master gardeners in your community. I know some of the BFAs have demonstration plots. Have a little spot where you're showing how to save seeds, make it easy and fun. Ellen, I know you'd work a lot with school groups. They're just so many ways it sounds like we can help support you and be part of this and we'll also share the links again in that recording with the GoFundMe um, links for the organizations you're doing because this is this is great um, and thank you so much thank you all thanks Chris see you see you love you guys <laughs> bye thank you thanks for hanging bye. in there thank you be great.